All right, what is up guys? So a concept that I've wanted to cover for a while and something that I learned far, far too late into my sort of web dev journey was authentication. For, I sort of started out in the Firebase world. I used Firebase Auth and then I transferred to Next and then I used Auth0 and then I used Next Auth and I never really understood what was going on under the hood. Now let me be clear before this video starts. You should be using those providers and you should use some form of authentication service or at least authentication package for your framework or language. However, I think that understanding what's really happening under the hood and the sort of concepts that go into this are very important. They'll lead you to making much better decisions and they'll lead you to utilizing these frameworks and services like Auth0 or NextAuth in a, in a much more complete way. If that makes any sense, it'll make more sense later. So what I want to do is I want to break down what are JWTs and how do they work. Then I want to talk about a visual example of how authentication works. And then I'm going to break down a simple custom authentication implementation I wrote and sort of go over what's happening and see what's happening and then sort of finish with why you should not be using this stuff, why you really do need to use these providers and leverage all the features they give you. Real quick, before we get into this, I want to call out, we are 15 days into November. I have been putting something out every single day throughout November, and the response has been phenomenal. I am extremely grateful for all of you guys who have been here, supporting this, doing as I learn how to do this stuff. Very foreign to me, but it's been going great. We're at 500 already, and let's try and get to 1,000 by the end of the month. If you're new, if you like this, please subscribe, join up. Comment whatever you want to see. I've got some bigger stuff coming next week, but there's a few days open there. So if there's concepts you want to see or frameworks or whatever, let me know and I will try and fit it in. But without further ado, let's break down these JWTs. So what I made right here is just a visual diagram of what a JWT is. So you can get this sort of thing off of their website too, but I want to just make my own. Or this is what an actual JWT looks like. So it's a bunch of nonsense, but it's nonsense separated by dots. We have a header, dot payload, dot signature. So when a token is in its sort of token form, it looks like this. And then when you break it apart and you do token dot decode and pass in your secret, it'll turn into this. So we go over here. The first thing we have is our header. That's everything before the first dot. The header is typically just going to include the algorithm and the type. And of course, these are JWTs. So it's just JWT, but then the important part comes in the payload. The payload is the part that, truthfully, I didn't understand for a really long time. If you've ever used Auth0 and you've wondered why, like, you can get request.user.sub or what that sub is, that is something that's coming from the JWT in the payload, and that's how we can then, on the front end, get our end user's ID. So the stuff that's contained in the payload is a list of claims. So these claims are semantically defined as they're just statements about an entity, but 99% of the time it's going to be about some authenticated user if you're in the authentication use case, which if you're here, you are. So we consider these to be different things about the user. Now, these are by convention, you want to make them as short as possible because we want to keep our JWTs as short as possible. And then there are three different types of claims within this payload. So the first one that you're going to have in here are the recommended types. That's going to include ISS, which is issuer. Then you're going to have sub, which is the subject. Typically, 95% of the time, that's just going to be the end user's ID. We have EXP and IAT. EXP is what you would imagine, expiration. And then IAT is issued at. So you have that first type, and those are recommended to be on every J JWT. Then we have a second type, which is going to be the public claims. So these public claims are things that we can pass into the JWT to give more information to it so that we can then map it to an end user. So that's where we'd have stuff like we have sub already in there, but if you wanted to pass in like the user's name and their email and that kind of thing so that we can then access that stuff anywhere. Then when we get into the public claims, I have this list pulled up from IANA and what this is, is they have a full list of what the um, specified public claims are. So there are certain standards that they've created so that you want to make it so that if you want to put your email in there, for example, you don't have a collision with someone else putting their email in a different way. So you don't want to have capital E email and then lowercase e email. You just want to have email as it's defined right here. So this sort of thing, I'll link this down below, but this gives you, these are all the public claim standards that are out there. These are, if you have, a, if you need to pass something in that's on this list, you pass it in in this manner. So then finally, we have the last type, which is going to be the private claims. The private claims are customizable claims that you can pass in whatever you generally want. These are typically going to be used if you're using like your JWTs and authentication in conjunction with some external service, or if you need to pass in some key or whatever you need to do. That would be done within the private claims. And the last piece is going to be the signature down here. So that's sort of what makes up a JWT, and effectively all it really is, is it's just a um, 
it's just a hash together information dump. So you can just put, it's just a bunch of information stitched together, which we can then pass up and down for, between the client and server to then use as an authentication key to be to see, okay, this has been signed by the right server, it works. This diagram is an example of some basic authentication stuff you would do. And if you're using a package like NextAuth or you're using Auth0 or whatever, it's sort of wrapping, it's basically just a wrapper around this with some extra fancy stuff in there. But generally speaking, the way it works is the JWT is just gonna get passed up and down between the client and the server to verify who the user is and then verify that they are authorized to do what they're trying to do. So the typical, the obvious start of an authentication session or whatever is going to be a login. So you would make a request to API auth login and then you would pass in your email and password and then that they, then the server would return to you a JWT. Then the client can store that, do whatever it wants. This is not necessarily how it always works. There are often refresh tokens and that kind of thing. But for the sake of this, just consider you bring down a token and then just keep it on the client. So once we have this, this token, we've saved it onto our client. It's got an expiration date of like one day. So we're authenticated for one day. Then our client is going to go ahead and make a request to API slash off slash me. This is going to get all their profile info and any... Yeah, it's going to get all their profile info. So what we would do is we make a request and we pass in the JWT as a header. Uh, by convention, it's typically going to be bearer space the JWT. I'll show you that in the code in a moment here. But we pass that JWT up to API auth me. Then we get the info from the profile, do some database logic, whatever. Then we pass that back down to the client and we send them the user data. So it gives a token, gets user data. Then finally, we have like a protected route, and then this is going to utilize some authorization stuff. And the way authorization works is you just have to implement it on the server side, but this JWT can be used to recognize who the user is. And then once we get the user out of the database, we can check a role, or you could even put a role on the JWT, but it's better to put it on a database entry. So you would put that role on the database entry, use this JWT to figure out what the user is, make sure that they're who they say they are. Then if they're authorized for that, you pass down the secret data. So Basically, what I'm trying to show you here is authentication happens on the server. This is something I didn't understand for the longest time. I remember when I first used the next auth, um, not next auth, I used the Next.js and Auth0 package. I could not wrap my head around it for the life of me because in the React side, I had this like use next auth hook or whatever. I thought that's just how authentication works and I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to connect the two back and forth. I couldn't figure out how to authenticate on my server but then down to the client. I had no clue what was going on. I thought that like the client was doing all the authentication stuff but I just had it backwards. I had it backwards in my head. What's really happening is when you use these providers they're really just spinning up these roots under the hood and they're giving you the ability to wrap them in nice easy to call and easy to deal with functions but they do all of this for you under the hood. Whenever you call the login function from Auth0 in their like React package or whatever, that's actually going to be firing this request up to your server and it's gonna be generating those tokens, bringing them down, keeping them on your machine in a secure way. And then if you need to get your profile info, so if you do like use user and then you get your user back, this is actually doing a call to API auth slash me. And then that's also how they check, are you logged in or not? You can check, okay, is there a token? If there is, we try it. If it fails and returns unauthorized, okay, they're not logged in. So we can just set user to null and then the front end logic can flow from there. So hopefully this gives you the idea that it happens on the server. So the final thing I'm going to do is I want to show you a code example of all this. So what I'm doing right here is this is a sort of like custom authentication example that I built out to sort of illustrate how all of this really works and show you some code. So we go into our API directory. So we go into API auth. I have these four routes. I have login, me, refresh, and register. Now this refresh route is kind of interesting because what we talked about before is obviously login. That makes sense. Register makes sense. Creating the account, generating all that basic info. Me makes sense. That's just getting the information of whatever user it is. But then why do we have this refresh route? So one common pattern that's kind of grown in popularity, especially with uh, patterns like OAuth is a refresh token. You don't want to just leave your tokens on the client all the time and you can't let them exist forever. So what you do instead and you can't like have them expire in five minutes and then the user has to log in every five minutes or that's horrible UX. So what you have to do instead is you have to store what's called a refresh token. And that refresh token is a special kind of token that you can send to the server and then that will generate a new authorization token for you. We use the authorization token to make requests to different routes. We use the refresh token to get more authentication. This is like a basic refresh method I implemented here. It's not how you probably do it in real life. And it's one of those things where it's kind of a pain to deal with. And it's one of the reasons why using these built-in providers like Auth0 or NextAuth or whatever is 
makes a huge difference because you don't have to worry about the overhead and dealing with all of this because storing JWTs and, and stuff like that on the client is trickier than you'd think. Just putting it in local storage isn't a good idea because that's um, makes it that makes it vulnerable to cross-site scripting attacks, which basically means that just a different site is going to be accessing your local storage and executing JS to grab that local storage from you. Then suddenly they have your key, they are you, they steal all your data, and you're set. So we don't want that to happen, but then we also don't want to just set them in like server-side cookies, because if we do that, then suddenly our API is tightly coupled to this cookie layer, and what if we want to do this onto a mobile app or a desktop app or something that doesn't have that? And you see how this sort of turns into a nightmare. That's where the solution of refresh tokens comes in, but actually implementing and using these refresh tokens kind of sucks, which is where the frameworks come in, which have done this for you. They have all the encryption done uh, algorithms set up for you. You don't have to worry about anything. All you have to do is just plug in your data and generally understand what they're doing, and then it'll work. So let's look at each of these routes. First of all, let's just start at the beginning with register. So on this register, I have just a next API route right here, and I just make sure my method is post, and then I have this handler. So what I'm doing first is I've validated the body. They need to pass in an email, a password, first name, and last name. Pass all this stuff in, make sure it's there. And then I have a try catch wrapping the actual creation algorithm. So this register handler, if we go to this function, is going to do the bulk of the work. So the first thing we need to do is we need to make sure, okay, does this user exist or not? So if the user does exist, then, um, why are, then they shouldn't be registering. They already exist. Send back an error. Then if they don't exist so we can actually create them, we need to hash their password. So we use bcrypt to hash their password. Um, you don't want to use an encryption. You want to just use a hash because you don't want it to be two way. You want it to just be one way. And then in order to actually test whether or not the password is valid, you, you hash the new password and then compare them against each other. This is yet another reason why you should be using these providers, these OAuths, whatever. They will do all of this for you. You are not responsible for hashing the password, storing the password, salting the password, et cetera, et cetera. So generally speaking, that's hashing the, we hash the password because we can't sort in clear text. Then we want to just create our, our user entry and then return them. So then going back to our um, register, yeah, going back to our register route, the final thing we need to do is actually create their token. So creating this token will create the JWT that authorizes this user to do stuff. So we go and we look at this token, what's actually happening in here. First we need to, okay, does the user exist? Yes. Then once it does exist, we need to actually fill out the contents of this token. So what you're looking at right here are the claims. The claims are, that's that middle layer of the JWT, which contains the basic information about the user that we can then use on the server to see, okay, whose token is this actually? So we're passing in the sub, which is going to be their ID, then the name, which is going to be their first and last name uh, concatenated together, then their email, then when we initialized it, um, yeah, when we initialize this token, then the expiration date, and then some extra stuff for an external service, and this would be so, an example of the private claims. Once we've done that, we want to create the token by signing it. We just use the JWT package, so we just do JWT.sign. We need to pass it a JWT secret because that's how when we um, like break it apart, we make sure, okay, is this valid? Because you can just go online and just make a JWT that says whatever you want, but the way you make sure that these are valid is by using the secret, and that's what that signature at the end is. That final block is super important, because it what's, it's what makes sure that A, it was signed by the right person, and B, it hasn't been altered and messed with. So once we've done that, we can go ahead and log our user it in and the way we do that is we need to store their session in the database so we set their session token in our data and that way when we and that way so that when they make a request later to for example go to their slash me route they we can check we can check their entry in the database and say okay are a are they who they say they are b is this token valid and c is it their current session token so is it the right token for them to be using because if we needed to for some reason if the user got compromised or whatever we can wipe out this session token on the database side and then suddenly they don't have access and then we return our logged in user and we have um we yeah we return the logged in user i destructure it to grab the session token and then we pass this back down to the end user via the authorization header so the pattern you're going to see is this sort of set header or sorry the pattern you're going to see is passing the jwts via this authorization header and bare space the thing that's just the standard so right here we look at this i just did a basic little example of email password first name last name and then api auth register yeah so we got our basic info in here and then if we go into our headers what we can see is we have this authorization header and that bare of all this crap in here so i'm going to copy this and what this is is this is the actual jwt that has the user info on it so if i copy this jwt so 
So if I copy that JWT and I go to JWT.io, I can paste this in and you're going to see what's actually being stored within it. So like I said earlier, the claim section, we were actually filling that data in. We look at what the payload is. The sub is my ID, the name, email, when it was created, the external stuff, and then the expiration date, all right there. So we have this JWT and it's got its signature. Now, if we break the signature, it won't be valid and it won't work anymore. So it's critical that we keep that together, but yeah. So that's the registration route. Uh, the next ones aren't nearly as complicated. The login route is pretty simple. It's just how you would expect it to work. We get the email and password from the body. We then you call our login handler in here, which is going to pretty much just check, okay, does this user exist? If it does, then we need to check the password. We use bcrypt.compare. I just did it synchronously. And then we make sure that their password matches. If it doesn't match, we throw an error. They're not authorized. But if it does match, then we can just create their token and then send that back down to the end user. So if we look right here again, we have, we get the user out and then we send back the authorization bearer session token. So if I go back in here to, so if I go back in here to my Postman client, and I go to auth slash login. I still have email and password in my body. I hit send. It's going to do a bunch of stuff. And then I'm going to get back a new bearer. So I'm going to get back a new JWT. So this is my new token. And then you store this on the front end. And then whenever we need to make more requests to get information about this user, we need to pass this in. So let's see how we do that in the me route. Okay, so what you're looking at right here is the me route. Very simple. We're just going to get the information about the user. So this is instead of being a post request, it's now a get request. And then inside of this handler, what we're going to do is we're just going to call the me handler. So we go inside here. First thing we need to do is we need to check whether or not they passed in this token. I'll show you how to actually do that in the client, but it's just a header. So you just set that header of authorization equal to bear space token. We put that in there, make sure it's there. If it's in there, then we need to go ahead and decode it. So we verify it. So we pass in the token and we pass in that same JWT secret. That's how we verify that it's right. This will fail if the secret doesn't match and it will also fail if the token doesn't match the original token. So once we've done that, we get this decoded info and this user, this decoded stuff is all it's going to do is just give us the claims. So we've got up here, we can just take the user ID out and that's just going to be the external stuff that I was doing. So once I've gotten that user ID, I just need to find the user from the database, go through basic query. And then finally, we need to ensure that their session is actually valid. So remember earlier when we save that session token, what we do is we can just compare that session token against the token that was passed in. If the two are equal, then it's their current valid session. Then we can send down the end user. So then it's just back up here. And now what we can do is actually test this. So I have this guy down here. Let's copy this. And now let's go back up in here to my authorization. And then I'm going to paste that in. So this is now one of my headers. And I'm going to go to API slash auth slash me like I have over here. And then we're going to set this to be a get request. And then we're going to send this. And when we send this, we're going to get a 200 back. If we look at our body, we just have the basic user information. So this is how we populate, you know, like I said, nav bar, whatever you want to do. Finally, we have the refresh. And the refresh is extremely simple. It will just cycle their token. So by default, the way I have it set up, these tokens will expire every 24 hours. If it's about to expire, you can just check on the front end. And then what you can do is you can just refresh it. So you send, make a request to refresh. It'll, it'll send that, it'll generate a new token, set that as the current session, and then send that token down to the end user. If you want to learn more about refresh tokens, I'll put some links to that down below. But again, not the biggest concern in the world. I would be more worried about just kind of getting the concept of what's being stored within these claims. How are these where is the authentication actually taking place and what do these frameworks actually do for it? So yeah, that is basically the gist of how authentication really works, at least it, with JWTs and stuff. That's how NextAuth implements it. Um, I'm not so sure about Firebase, but I know uh, Auth0 does. So it's very common. You're going to see it basically everywhere. And it's very important that you sort of get this idea of it's very important that you get the idea of how this works, particularly in these meta frameworks. So I can't I have to verify all my tokens and verify all my authentication stuff in this API directory. I can't do it on this page. On this like front page or whatever, I can't do authentication stuff. I have to make a request to do it or use something like get server side props or some SSR thing to actually get that information down. So I think that pretty much covers it. Hopefully that gives you a better idea of how this authentication stuff works and how much of a pain it is to actually implement. Use these sort of pre-built frameworks. They'll save you a lot of time and a lot of hassle, but know how they're working under the hood. Uh, thanks for watching. Have a great day.